Welcome to the Industry Experts Panel at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Holliday. There is no other expert in the field of silver with as much experience as the silver guru himself, Mr. David Morgan. David is an expert in precious metals with degrees in both engineering and finance. He is the founder of the Morgan Report. He frequently is invited to be the keynote speaker and a media guest on outlets such as CNBC, Fox Business News, and the Wall Street Journal. He is a contributor to many of the most important publications within the field of silver. And right now, silver is in a very rare and unexpected breakout that has not been seen since 2001. We have prepared a special report to break it down for everyone. As always, it is free. It can be found at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com slash ratio. That's R-A-T-I-O. It is an exciting report, and this is an exciting time for everybody that loves silver. David, welcome to the show. How are you today? Michelle, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. This is amazing. Now, from your perspective, is silver by definition right now in a bull market? And what would you define as a silver bull market? Well, bull markets easily defined as it's higher lows. So if you as all markets move up and down, if you plot those on a daily basis or weekly basis or even a monthly basis, what you look for is a higher high. And when the correction takes place, profit taking, whatever you want to call it, the low is a higher low out in time. And silver really hasn't exhibited that uh, for a while. I mean, it's a very tight case for silver. For gold, it's very clear that we had a breakout recently and that it was in a bull move from December 2015 until the breakout. Silver was slightly higher. You almost could say it double bottomed uh, from the 2015 low. And I would like to see silver do a little bit better than it's doing. The ratio got extremely high, about 95 to 1. It dropped about 85 to 1. As we're doing the interview, I'm not certain where it's at, probably around 88 or so, I'm guessing. But uh, I like to see silver get into the 1850-19 range uh, to confirm the gold move. I'm sure silver will catch up to gold and outperform at some point. But right now, as we're doing the interview, uh, gold has been the leader. Gold's got the volume. Gold's got the, uh, the interest of you know, most of the financial press, and that's well and good. It's actually an opportunity for the unloved, unknown, <laughs> at times hated metal, silver. So Ignore yeah, silver. <laughs> you, know, you could basically make a swap. You could swap out gold for silver right now, and then when the ratio gets to, well, something like it did in uh, the last run-up in the 2011, the ratio hit 35 to 1, you could swap back from your silver back into gold and double your gold position. So, wow, excellent. Now, you know, David, currently most miners of silver do so profitably at about $17 per ounce, and there seems to be no real shortage of silver. Paper contracts do carry multitudes of the physical form, but that's a different story if everyone were to take it in physical form, which has not happened yet. So there seems to be a sufficient supply for all of the industrial uses of it. So make the case for us for the reasons that silver should be trading higher. Well, that's a great question. I mean, silver, so I'm going to give you a little bit of a history here, but so from 1990 to 2005, 2006, silver was in a deficit. So supply and demand has to meet every year. And so the supply of silver at 1990 was roughly 2 billion ounces of physical silver. And the offtake was substantial from, it still is rather substantial, from uh, 1990 through 2005. But there was a deficit, meaning that the amount mined and recycled did not meet total demand. So how is the total demand met by supply? The above ground supply was depleted. So we went from 1990 of 2 billion ounces above ground to 2005 with 500 million ounces above ground, which means we lost 1.5 billion ounces of physical silver from the above ground stockpile during that time frame of about 15 years. So roughly, and uh, it's an easy arithmetic problem, about 100 million ounces a year were taken off of 
the stockpile, wherever it was. Didn't, not necessarily the Comex, it came from all over. From that point on, when the bull market really got going, which was the early 2000s, the mining industry took off like crazy. And it was driven primarily by China having what I would call their industrial revolution. And this meant everything, copper, lead, zinc, silver, nickel, you name it. They needed it. They wanted it, concrete. And so what took place and continues is that the above ground stockpile went from the 500 million low back up to right now where we're at least 2 billion ounces of silver above ground, if not 2.2 billion ounces. No one knows the exact numbers, but round numbers, we have a pretty good idea of generally how much. So the above ground stockpile has been rebuilt um, because the mining industry has grown substantially from where it was in the early 2000s to where it is, you know, from 2005, 6, 7, 8, 9 onward. So there's that. Now, you said to build a case why, you know, silver prices would go up. Well, all markets move at the margin. And the margin means it's the last bidder at the auction of Sotheby's or whatever, that, or the auto auction that gets the automobile or the painting or whatever you're bidding on. In other words, in an open free market system, then the last bid, the highest bid, gets the product. So in the silver market, those bidders are the investors primarily. Now, industry will pay almost any price for silver because it's price inelastic, which means if you're building a $4,000 refrigerator and it takes uh, a quarter of an ounce of silver, it doesn't matter if that silver is 20 bucks an ounce or 200 bucks an ounce. It's so small relative to the $4,000 price tag that, you know, the Whirlpool Maytag, uh, you know, whatever the Gen Air, whatever the refrigerator manufacturers is going to buy that silver. It's That's inside. very interesting. That's a very interesting point. That's the first time I've really heard that point be made. So for the huge amount of industrial uses, they will pay whatever the market deems. Absolutely. In almost all cases, there's very few cases where you can say where silver is such a large component of the finished product that it's meaningful to the overall price. I mean, take your cell phone, right? Right. I mean, silver's in there, so is gold. But uh, the amount of uh, silver or gold that's in that cell phone for what are they these days? 500, 600, 700 bucks. <laughs> and the amount of silver that's actually required. It's absolutely a must. It can't be substituted. I mean, you could substitute platinum for it maybe, or, but still nothing conducts electricity. Like silver. the point being is just what you said. I'm reiterating it, make a very strong point that in almost all cases, now in artwork, that's not true. If you're buying, you know, silverware, it's not true. If you're buying silver jewelry, it's not true. But in most industrial applications, silver is used in a very small amount relative to the end product that costs substantially more. So if silver goes from 20 to 200, the manufacturer might care somewhat, but it's going to be meaningless in the overall price structure of the overall sales of the product. Now, they may use it as an excuse to pop up prices. I mean, they're refrigerating, oh my goodness, silver's gone up. Tenfold, <laughs> 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 right. our refrigerator, which is really a lie, but that's what they might do. So, that is just such an interesting point because I don't think people realize the huge numbers of industrial products that absolutely require silver. And so, it's an interesting point that even if silver does shoot up, let's just say it goes up to you know 400 dollars an ounce overnight, they are still going to need it, still going to buy it, and it's not going to affect anything at all. Because that was a very, um, that's a concern to some people. It's like, what if it goes up, the industrial, how will it affect anyone? It won't. No, it won't. It will affect the amount of silverware that's bought, and it'll probably affect the amount of silver jewelry that's bought. But as far as the 60%, 55% that's used in the industry, it's not going to affect it. I'm telling you the truth. Right. Most people don't get it. You get it. But no, it's not. David, how many products would you estimate use silver, re require? Thousands, I couldn't tell you, Michelle. I mean, with the, you know, it depends how you divide the product. I mean, you know, if you look like a, what, a DVD player, there's probably only two real manufacturers, but 27 different labels on them because 
the guts are the same, but they put, you know, Philips and Sony and Toshiba and Samsung and whatever label on it. It's basically the same guts, but there's a lot of sellers of that product. So it depends how you define it, but I, I'm comfortable saying thousands. I mean, with the electronic world, everything electrical or electronic uses silver. And in this world that we're in now, everyone's, you know, got their cell phone or two. I mean, there's more cell phones. I may have this wrong. I read this recently. Maybe I misread it. If I read it correctly, there's more cell phones out there than there are populations. <laughs> in other words, there's more than one cell phone per person. And maybe I'm wrong. I read that recently. I'm like, I couldn't believe it. So anyway, maybe someone could correct me. Well, people I know have 12 old cell phones in their drawer. You know what I mean? They just stick them in there. So it's. Totally believable. David, I want to shift over to a topic that's been widely discussed for years. Many banking institutions have been officially accused of manipulation when it comes to precious metals. How much of an impact does the paper short positions of banks have in determining the long run cycles of the price of silver? Yeah, that's a very good question. And I think everybody listening wants to know the exact answer. And, you know, I've been deemed with being fairly knowledgeable on this topic. And, you know, I put my tongue in my cheek somewhat because certainly no one knows everything. I'm always learning more. And whether or not I'm, you know, the expert or not remains to be determined. I don't really consider myself as the Thank expert you know, <laughs> a class with, you know, the Hugo Salinas prices and you know, Franklin Sanders and Jeff Christian and, you know, some of the others out there that certainly have studied the silver market to the same level that I have. But the price has been managed by the banking community for quite some time. The area that very few people discuss is this. Wherever the price is, however it got there, manipulated or not, that's the price. Now, let's examine that further. At any given price, is there enough of the product to meet the physical demand? And if the answer is yes, then what that says is, regardless of price, there's enough of the product to meet the demand. As I talked about, how do we you know, satisfy demand between 1990 and 2005? Well, we ate up the above ground supply, but now that's grown back. So there's only been a few instances where we've seen the physical market absolutely take control, which is what I've said and many others needs to take place to find the absolute free market price of silver, gold, or anything else out there that's being, let's say, managed price level wise. And that's pretty tough, but it's happened in the palladium market a couple of times. And I believe it happened in the silver market in the financial crisis. Now in the silver crisis of 2008 or financial crisis 2008 silver on the paper exchanges was like nine dollars and in the retail market was like 13. so what that really meant was there wasn't a silver pri uh, there wasn't a silver shortage there was a silver retail product shortage meaning finished products such as silver eagles or any government minted coin privately minted silver medallions, one ounce wafers, 10 ounce wafers, 100 ounce bars, any of those products were in such tight supply that the offer bid spread was huge. So, but the physical silver market, which is the bullion price or the commercial bar price was at $9 and there was ample supply of silver, the thousand ounce bars at $9. I know not only by you know, looking at the market, but also I bought 3,000 ounces, so three 1,000 ounce bars, had them delivered, everything else. So there's only been a few times where the physical market had really taken control. And of course, again, that's where you'll get. Uh, and, and if you had a more, you know, free market, I mean, you'd have a higher price level, I'm convinced, than you have right now. It certainly has suppressed the price, but where would the price be without any manipulation? Right now, today, I don't know, but it might shock people is what I'm going to say. And I'm just giving you a number. I'm trying to make it a thought experiment. I'm not trying to say, well, David says it's this. He's wrong, 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 wrong. Don't focus on the number I'm going to throw out. Throw out the idea that if things were in balance and the paper market didn't control the price and it was really a, a free market where the markets were balanced by true supply and demand, you might be at $30, $35 silver right now. 
Uh, the reason you get an extreme price in gold or silver isn't um, an equilibrium price based on, you know, a free market. I mean, that's part of it. I want to state this correctly. The reason you get an extreme run is because of economic uncertainty, failure of government. I mean, all the face, things that we've been facing that I've been talking about for the last 20 years, that's when people get scared of, you know, the failure of their government or their monetary system. And there's this huge run to gold. These are fairly rare events. Yes, as Mike Maloney says, there's a change in the currency and all that. And everything he says is factually true. But I'm talking about slightly different than that. My, what I'm talking about are these extreme situations where there's a failure of confidence, where there's a loss of the con game. And when those are fairly rare. When those happen, this is when you get these huge spikes in the paper price of the metals. And that's what I think is going to happen still, regardless of what happens in the paper markets. You know, like the Palladium market in the early 2000s when Ford Motor Company bought Palladium to uh, reline their uh, catalytic converters from platinum. That shot the Palladium price up into the stratosphere, I think to 1100 and out, if I remember correctly. And so all it will really take is more physical buying. And at some point, and I think it could be taking place with gold right now, Michelle. In fact, I'm on record as already having said that. Gold markets trading as if there's something much more going on than just the paper swaps that we're so used to following. The gold markets trading, every time it gets a downturn, it's brief uh, and it moves back up. There will be a correction. There'll be profit taking at some point. I mean, the futures boys, you know, they love their paper money and they're going to take it at some point and it will correct. But um, the market's trading is the physical market and gold has control. Silver, I'm not convinced yet. It's moving up with gold, but it's kind of reluctantly clawing its way up. It's not trading the way I'd like to see it trade and I think it will eventually trade. Hmm. So you see that too. The founder of our company at Portfolio Wealth Global um, had mentioned that he'd been, he stays in constant contact with the large bullion dealers. And he mentioned that silver doesn't have that euphoric feeling that gold does right now. And that's sort of odd because you'd think they'd be running uh, neck and neck, well, not neck and neck price wise, but they sort of mirror each other going up, but you don't see that in silver right now either. Yeah, that's true. I agree. I, I think silver is, you know, it's a more volatile metal. I think a lot of your more aggressive investors or maybe speculators is a better word, got burnt out on it. I think a lot of the young aggressive guys said the heck with silver, took their monster boxes into the local dealer, got their cash and went into the crypto market. I think the crypto market affected silver far more than it affected the gold market. <clears throat> and, uh, but I do think it'll come back. Uh, in fact, well, I do. I do think that silver will come back, but I think it's going to be, uh, as I said, it's going to be kind of dragged up by gold. There's still gold bucks out there that really don't believe. In fact, let me restate that. Believe it or not, this whole move that's been rather substantial has been mostly institutional buying. It's been mostly moves of gold into the ETFs. The, if you check and you can ask your boss, I mean, I've called, you know, the Dylan Gages, the A Mark, some of the largest retailers that you know you know the names of, and I'm a first name basis of many of them. A lot of the public has sold their gold back at fifteen hundred bucks an ounce. You know they bought it at fifteen hundred six seven years ago, and here it is. Oh my goodness, it's back to where? Hey Martha, I didn't lose on my gold purchase. I sold it for fifteen hundred bucks just where we bought it six years ago. So this is, there's actually, and you know that for two reasons. One, I talk to the dealers, and secondly, the spreads. Whenever there's a very tight spread between the bid and ask, that means there's ample supply. And it's a very, very minimal spread right now. In fact, some dealers really don't want to buy back some product they're so plentiful. So right now, on the retail side, the market's not nearly as robust as we know it is from the institutional side. So we're in an interesting place in the gold market right now. That is very interesting. Now, what do you foresee in the immediate future in terms of both silver and gold? Well, back and forth, some a correction at some point, probably in the fairly near future, a new trading range, a new base established, but kind of a long, uh, what would you say, a breather, you know, 
deep breath and it's like, okay, yeah, we are actually in a bull market. And yeah, maybe I should get back in the market. And people start looking at, you know, newsletters like mine or, you know, the physical market or adding to their position. Or if they're overweighted, it's like I said, you know, maybe, yeah, you know, I probably bought too much gold. I don't need, you know, 30% of my portfolio. I'm only down a hundred bucks a coin. I'm going to take that out, you know, whatever. So there'll be a lot of that kind of thing. But right now we kind of need a, a consolidation, a verification that it's real. A lot of these, you know, as I said, I'll repeat myself and say it slightly differently. A lot of these people on the retail side don't believe it's a real move yet. You know, why else would you sell your, if you buy your gold at 1500 you waited six or seven years and you're selling it for 1500 there's a reason you did that. One, you hate to take a loss, so you like to tell your wife or your boyfriend that you didn't lose in the gold market. But you also have the feeling that that's about it, that, you know, it's not really going higher. If you thought that this market was on fire, you wouldn't sell 1500 So, yeah, well, I'm even now, but, man, this is going to 2000 by the end of the year. And that's not what the retail side is doing or thinking right now on in a broad brush sense. I mean, there's, you know – whenever I get asked why does the market move, I mean, that's an impossible question to answer because there's so many variables. You know, why did somebody sell? Well, they had to pay a bill or you know, had a medical emergency or they had to sell it and get a car. I mean, there's lots of whys. The point is when you look at it at a broad brush, you have to look at the holes, which is what I'm doing, which doesn't factor in every single instance, but it gives you a good idea. And the good idea is that it's very interesting. You know, we're seeing the retail side complacent. You know, doesn't that reflect on confidence in the economy? I mean, it does in a way. Yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, this Trump train thing, whatever you want to call it. I have a little different view. I try to be agnostic on politics. It's tough. But, um, you know, the overall global economy is contracting relative to the rest of the globe or the plane, whatever it is. <laughs> Sorry. The um, America looks great, but it's on a relative basis. You know, it's the old adage, all things are relative. I mean, relative to China and Europe and, uh, you know, South Africa and all these places having massive problems and massive contractions, the U.S. looks pretty decent. But overall, the global economy, the overall economy, world economy, is not doing well. It's contracting. It's not expanding. Oh, there may be instances where certain businesses are expanding or certain places, but the main expansion is in the money supply. That's what's expanding. And the money supply, of course, factors into the GDP, but no one really isolates it out and says, oh, this GDP that we have, which is you know, 2.2%, uh, what do we really look at it? with a microscope, you're going to find that most of that was just because they pumped up the money supply. It didn't really increase productivity per se, but of course, no one, I would say no one, John Williams and others will look at it objectively and tell the truth to the public, but you're not going to hear that on the mainstream financial press, believe me. You know, David, staying with President Trump, just for a moment. He's being very adamant about adjusting the U.S. dollar down as a fundamental way to keep our country competitive on a global scale. What are your thoughts on how this could affect precious metals, if at all? Well, well, um, uh, it's it's the race to the bottom. Everyone wants to get a competitive advantage by devaluing their currency. The United States is no different. So as Jim Dines calls us, a race to the bottom. And think about that. You really want your currency to become worth less and worth less and worthless, you know, but anyway, that's the, that's what's going on. And how, how will it affect it? I mean, basically you'll have a currency crisis or a currency war, which we're really experiencing right now. And it doesn't end well. Uh, so it may help on a near term or an inter- intermediate term basis where people feel better or maybe you're able to export more or get your balance of trade more in line and things that, you know, look good, but it's impossible for the Americans to really get their trade balance in line because of the, what's called Tiffin's dilemma. And you can look it up, but I don't have time to explain it, but Basically, when you're the reserve currency of the world, you must increase the money supply or else you contract the rest of the world's economic situation. So we are in a paper money scheme. 
experiment that's failing miserably, but no one at the top level wants to admit it in such plain English as I just stated it, yet they all know it. There's no one out there at the banking level at any, you know, at any decent level up in the executive branch. It doesn't understand what's really happening. But they all, as Jim Sinclair says, extend and pretend. They pretend it's okay, and they, they pretend that they can extend it indefinitely. In other words, there's really no consequence to continuing this scheme. And now you have uh, proponents that say that's an absolute fact. This is the modern money theory that doesn't matter what your deficits are. It doesn't matter how much you print. You can just print to the kingdom come. You can drop it from helicopters. You can do whatever you want with it. It doesn't matter. It's already been proven that it doesn't have any effect on the overall economy. Print it up as much as you want. Go for the green economy. Give everybody a big raise. Have a minimum wage in any place you want to put it. doesn't matter. And, of course, these people are not very conversant in the monetary history to understand it has a big effect and there's a price to pay and it has dire consequences. That's the truth of the matter. But at the end of these situations, and it's, it's a cycle that repeats, we're in a situation where we're there again. And, of course, you have these fools that will come out and tell you, no, modern money, theory, yeah, print up all you want. doesn't matter. We just keep making the economy bigger and better. We'll just print it up. You know, the truth of the matter is very simply stated. I've said it on many of my interviews. You can't get something for nothing. I mean, we teach our kids, can't get something for nothing, but you know, everybody wants something. Well, I should say everybody, but many people, the majority wants something for nothing. That's why a democracy comes from mobocracy, mob rules, the majority rule. The majority will say, I want as much free stuff as I can possibly get at the expense of my neighbor that has to produce it because I don't want to produce it. He does. I deserve it, so give it to him. It's true. It's, it's just theft. When you yeah, know. it is theft, yeah. It's a very low state of being. It's a very low state. I mean, people, you know, I don't want to get too philosophical, but that attitude is a very uh, unenlightened position of humanity. And this is why, you know, it's uh, the great Jacques Fresco. And I don't agree with everything that Jacques said, but he was an excellent thinker. And, you know, we, we are not civilized at this point in time. We're really not. I agree with that statement. That's very interesting. Yeah. And, and they, they truly don't see it that way when they're thinking socialists, give it to me free, free education, free this, free that. Who's going to pay the teachers? Who's going to pay the light bill? Who's it? They, they seem to forget that nothing's free. Just like you said, all of it's going to come from, well, they're rich, they can do it. And then it's, it's disastrous because logically, if you're rich and people are going to say, we're going to take all your money. If you stay, you'll leave. And it sinks the country. I mean, that's a natural next step for a rich person if you bully them into believing they're going to get 70% of their income taken. Wouldn't you say? Yeah, I'd say it even goes beyond being rich. I mean, it's, it's uh, part of the financial survival instinct. I mean, basically, you're all self-serving at some level, some more than others. There's some altruistic people, and there's people that are very wealthy that give a lot. You know, set up foundations or educational centers or give scholarships or whatever. The point is that we have this built-in capacity to make sure that we're going to survive. And money for most people represents security. So the more money you have, the more security you have. But if you have insecurity surrounding your money, then everything is kind of topsy-turvy. And this is where we're going with the China situation, which I'll dive into. I don't know how long you want this interview to go. But with the social credit system, it supersedes money now because – if you go into, you know, uh, the money, you know, money <clears throat> in recent times, <clears throat> excuse me, if you had a lot of money, you had a lot of security. That's in the U.S. If you have a lot of money in China and you do something that the government doesn't like, it doesn't matter how much money you have. You don't have security because they'll say you cannot fly because of your social credit rating or you cannot buy this house because of your social credit rating or you can't transact in this business because of your social credit rating. So money becomes almost useless in that scenario where your viability to work in the system economically is based on how much your thought patterns adhere to the government line. So the more of a government good citizen you are, the more options you have financially regardless of your monetary power. And this is coming in the U.S. as well. I mean, we do have credit scores. Most people have to borrow money 
to, you know, get a car, buy a house, uh, whatever. Most people have to use the credit system. And if you have a credit system, well, I'll just put an S in front of it, social credit system. And this is, we're going that direction as well. So it's very interesting to me, especially being a student of monetary history and looking out in the future, what I see coming. And it's not um, to my liking, that's for sure. I mean, it's more and more restrictive. It's more and more control. It's more and more, you know, everything you think, do, and say is monitored. And that has an effect on what your social credit score is, which means how well you can get into the economy. And if you're a Christian bent at any level, be it 100%, you know, you're a Christian, you identify as a Christian, or even as you're secular, but you understand some of the tenets of Christianity, you're looking at, wow, this sounds a lot like this, you know, Mark situation where you're told if you could buy or sell based upon, you know, any given situation that you either adhere to the status quo, or if you don't, you're not going to get along. So, uh, very interesting times, Michelle. It's fascinating to watch this stuff. I um, certainly would probably not be a hit parade on any of the mainstream talk shows. I'm certain of that. But thank goodness we still have some options in the free internet side of things where you do a wonderful job and sites like yours do a wonderful job and at least give people, some people, the opportunity to hear the other side, whether they agree with it or not. You know, that's the uh, prerogative of being here. Human, you know, it's David's full of it, or I agree with it, or you know what? I never thought about that before. Even just picking up on the idea of price inelasticity of silver being used in industry, which kind of opened up your eyes a little bit, might be valuable to someone that's looking to get into the silver market. But I'm rambling. Bring me back on uh, on par here. But you really did hit a nerve there. Yeah, you're rambling on a very interesting topic that I really want to dive into because this this idea of social credit, most Americans, probably the majority of our listeners, um, don't realize what's happened in China. And I'd really like to go into that. When did this start and nutshell what social credit is for everyone? So well, I'm not that studying in it, so I'll be honest about that. I know enough to speak intelligently about it, or I think intelligently about it. When did it start? I'm not sure. Probably, I'm going to guess five, six years ago. And what it is basically is they spy on their citizenry just like the United States does. And basically, if you write something anti-government, say something anti-government, jaywalk a lot, uh, cut in line, um, buy too much of a certain product or anything, and numerous uh, situations that the government deems as wrong will lower your social credit rating. So they give you a score. It's just like a credit score in the United States. So you got like 900, you got a stellar credit rating. If you got a 432 or whatever it is that AOC has, you got a really lousy credit score. Of course, you know, if you're supposed to get everything for free. Why would you pay your bills that you pledged to pay anyway? Sorry, I digress, but he does have a very low credit score. Anyway, coming back. So this is the problem. That's a problem for the individual. The other problem is how it ostracizes that individual from everyone else. So mm -hmm. let's say, for example, I get a low credit rating because of what I do on the internet and what I say. So now if you do another interview, this is in China. But it could come to the U.S. So if you interview me, then your credit rating goes down because you're associating with someone with a low credit rating or a low, low social credit rating. And so now you don't want to interview me anymore because you know if you do, you're gonna, your score is going to go down. So these people get cast off out of society, basically, because anyone that associates with them doesn't want to because they don't want their social score to go down. So it's basically mind control. You either think the way we tell you to think or you jeopardize your ability to buy that, you know, the car, fly the, in first class, buy that meal, and do that entertainment or whatever else. So you can have all the money, you know, all the money and then some. But if you go to the counter and say, hey, I want to get a ticket for this play and I want to be in the first row, they say, well, not only can you not be in the first row, you can't even enter and watch this play. Well, why not? Because your social score is so low. That's why. I get out of here. And there's no one to appeal to. Well, let me talk to the manager. That's worthless. The state has determined what your social score is, and that's tough. And you can't talk to anyone about it. 
because no one wants to be associated with you. That's what everybody has to understand. The manager doesn't want to hear your complaint because the manager doesn't want to be known as communicating with you. Right. It's, it's an absolutely, so your credit score, you're basically wearing your social score on your t-shirt. When you walk out, everybody knows who is accepted and who isn't accepted. And the only way to be accepted is to think, say, and do exactly the same as what whoever is determining your score to be. Yeah, that's basically what the state says is, is correct. I mean, look at the way we're going, you know, here. No, I mean, all this is outlined in the book 1984 and to some degree, Brave New World. But basically, everything you think, do, and say is in the pill you took today. I mean, if you don't go along with what the party line is, you're ostracized. And the problem is that most of your people that lean that direction have been so brainwashed that they don't know they're brainwashed. They'll argue with you all day long that they're very open-minded and that they're free thinkers. But they're not. Not to say that... Any of us are free thinkers. I mean, take out a blank sheet of paper and put something down that's never been thought of before. I challenge you to do that. It's not that easy. But we're all influenced by our peer group and society at large and all that. The problem is that if one side of the argument is, is left out, uh, then you have a, a one system. And that one system is the system the state determines to be the correct system even if it is the most inhumane thing going. And you could be, in, I know some, you know, I've been to Beijing once, <clears throat> Hong Kong several times, not that Hong Kong's really China, but regardless, I have Chinese friends both there and here, and they just basically keep their mouth shut because they don't want to cause trouble, you know, and I get that. I mean, it, and it's coming here, it's here. It's not coming here, it's already here. So this whole idea of politically correct, I mean, even myself, and I'm pretty outspoken, obviously, I will double think things often, even though I, because I've just, you know, I've been trained by the system that, you know, well, do I say black? Do I say person of color? Do I say gay? Can I say uh, they? Is it a him? Am I using, I mean, all of this, what I consider to be mostly nonsense. I mean, these are human problems. They're not gay problems or they're not color problems. I mean, these are human problems. Look, America has the best melting pot in the world where we all get along. We just have the same rules. But the problem is, I don't use this metaphor. I've only used it once in any of you before. But think about this as a metaphor. Let's say that we all drive down the roadways with the same set of rules, okay? Now, when you're driving your car, do you think about the guy or the girl or the bus driver, if they're a liberal or conservative? No, of course no, not. Of course not. We're humans. We're operating a piece of machinery, and we all have the same set of rules, and everything gets along just fine, right? But now let's say that if you are a certain branch, like let's say that you are liberal, that for you, you get to change the rules, but no one else does. So you can run red lights, you can speed, you can uh, you know, not pause and just take a turn, whatever. What would happen to the traffic system? Yeah, go crazy. It'd be a huge mess. It'd be a huge mess almost instantly. And this is the road that we're going. I mean, that's a pretty good metaphor because what we're saying is that this group, everyone has to obey the rules <clears throat> as far as what you can say, except this group doesn't get to speak up, they're wrong. We only get to see this side, and only this side has the meaningful argument, or, or the only ones you're able to, to, to you know, you're able to uh, look at, or see, or talk about, or whatever. So, it's a very, very, very scary time. I mean, the, you know, there's nothing more important than, than freedom, and the First Amendment is about freedom of speech and the press. And that's the most important one. And the second amendment was basically to protect yourself from a tyrannical government if necessary. And it's also to protect the first one. You know, without the right to bear arms, you might not be able to say what you need to say. And I'm certainly a pacifist, believe me. Do I own a gun? Yes, I do. Uh, almost reluctantly, but I do. Um, but the point being that 
we are going down a place where it's gone before in history. I mean, look at Bastier's book, The Law, and as these laws get distorted more and more, one class of citizenry uh, gets a benefit at the expense of the other side, this is a very, very bad situation. Yeah, one of our most precious rights, two of them you just mentioned, the right to defend ourselves against whatever, including the government. Yeah. Uh, most, it, was, it was actually um, formed on the basis, our, our whole country was formed on the basis of we're defending ourselves against a tyrannical government. That's the whole reason America was formed. We were defending ourselves against England. Right. So um, that was the reason for the Second Amendment. People forget that um, or haven't been taught it. But the First Amendment, without it, um, without free speech, I have very strong points of view, as you do, mm-hmm. as many friends of mine do who have the opposite points of view. But it's a cherished American right to have your point of view, say your point of view, and then come together and say, why do you have that point of view? Why do I have this point of view? And that's what makes our country great. Can you imagine if everyone thought the exact same thought and held the exact same feeling? We'd be a country of robots. It'd be horrific. Yeah. Well, that's the direction I think we're we're pointed. Uh, And people that know in their heart of hearts that they don't agree, if you know, are afraid to speak out because they don't want their social credit score to be low. And so they just keep their mouth shut. And, you know, it's, it's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of pressure to go along with uh, <clears throat> the current status quo to have an easier life or a simpler life, or maybe the, I'm choosing the wrong words, but <clears throat> to have a life of where you're not being, uh, confrontational you know it's okay if your neighbor gets uh, taken away because of their beliefs or their outspokenness but uh, you're going to keep your mouth shut but you know we've already witnessed that during world war ii with Mm -hmm. what happened with uh you know the individuals based on uh, sexuality uh based on uh religious beliefs uh and based on uh ethnicity so we are in a situation where we need to come back to, in my view, center. You know, you want to hear both sides. As you said, you know, the old expression, steel on steel. One sharpens the other. You know, your viewpoint is that. Mine's different. We hear each other out. We don't scream at each other. We, have, we act like a human being, and we listen. And we listen carefully. And we listen really with our head and our heart. And we get an idea. Of, oh, you know what? You are making a good point. I never yeah. thought of it that That's way. That's the beauty of it. People say all the time to me things that – spark ideas in my own mind and make me change my opinion about certain things because I learn as I grow. I didn't come into this world knowing everything and I'm going to continue to change my mind and, and as will everyone else, because that's what we do as human beings. But it's this, this social credit score. I'm so glad you brought it up and I really wanted to dive into it. I encourage all of our listeners to look into this because this is exactly what our country is. When you can't say what you think, you are operating under a social credit score if you're actually ostracized. And that's the government now in China. Correct, David? Correct. That's right. That's That's amazing. Well, before we go, as an investment strategist, um, within the world of precious metals, what do you feel is the hottest opportunity right now? Is it in fact silver or do you have other suggestions? Oh, I've got one that I like to brag about. It's a, uh, e-waste it's on the front page of the website so if you go to the morganreport.com you can read about it this is if you put it in terms of a drill result is off the charts i mean this there's so much gold and silver thrown away into the landfills it's 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 a shame and this company has got a solution to that problem so it's really a way to recycle these precious metals and also bring a, a benefit to the investor and I'm actually the only one that's really on this company. I've been on it. The stock's been as low as like 25 cents, been up to almost two bucks. So I think around 60 cents. I don't follow it daily. It's a speculation. So you bet a little, win a lot. But I love the story. It's almost too good to be true. And I get that. I think that's why some people, you know, don't 
believe it or want to believe it or whatever, but it's environmentally friendly. So it replaces cyanide and it's going to continue to grow. What's the uh, dynamics on it? being a business guy and looking at businesses, generally speaking, I mean, it's a, a $10 million plant that produces 50 million the first year. So that's a pretty good return on capital. <laughs> awesome. And it can be found at your website. Well, it's for my paid subscribers. I mean, I, you know, like everybody else in the newsletter industry that features resources like I do, I mean, my business has gone from like uh, a level, it's about 25, 26% of what it used to be back in 2011. So I'm not struggling, struggling, but I'm certainly not um, <laughs> carefree like I was when silver was moving up from, you know, 20 to 50, but uh, it's coming back and, and uh, this is just a situation that I really love. I mean, I've looked at speculations my whole life, and uh, I've got very, very careful about them in the last 20 years or more. But I have never seen a speculation act as well as this one, but still a speculation. So you want to be a little bit careful. You don't want to bet, bet the farm on this thing. But if you bet, um, you know, uh, your carport on it, you might be very, very, very happy down the road. Interesting. Well, David, it's always amazing to have you on this show. Please tell everyone where they can go to find your website and what are some of the other offerings that you have? Sure. It's uh, themortgagereport.com. And I got a free letter as well as a paid letter. And as I said, that e-waste write-up is on the main part of the website. And um, if you get there, we've got a uh, podcast. We also have the books I've written, so you can do that. If you're so inclined, I do consultations. I try to keep the speaking tab current. I don't always do that, but I do speak uh, around the world, as you know, and then if there's someone that wants me to come speak at their event, you can just hit the speaker tab and fill out the form and ask, you know, ask me to come speak if you're so inclined. Uh, and that's really about it. It's a pretty simple layout. I've, you know, this is, I don't know what, the 10th iteration on the website that we've made. It's hopefully very clean and clear. Um, and uh, I'll leave it at that. Great. Definitely something to check out the new East Way, uh, E-Waste. Is that what you call yeah. it? Yeah. And when you get there, you know, it's, you got to scroll down a little bit. But there's a little movie. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it says, forget about Bitcoin. This revolutionary gold <laughs> production story could make you a fortune. It's a very short video. And I encourage everyone to kind of watch that. And if you scroll down to the bottom, it shows you on a really good gold mine how much gold ore you get. And then it shows you from this process what you get from uh, this e-waste recycling center. So, uh, or let's say it's <clears throat> the... Um, Sorry, I'm a little tired. The, the recycling ability is done, in stage, is done in stages. So you could put up a plant, as I said, for 10 million and, and it yields about 50 million gross. Uh, and that's one. And one wouldn't recycle the amount that's out there. I mean, you could do, actually, I haven't done the, the math on it, but hundreds of them probably. So it's not like there's one plant that's going to take care of all this e-waste. You will need several of them. So there's huge upside, huge growth potential. But uh, what's being done right now is um, more than the pilot plant form, but it's basically getting started. I mean, this is a company that if you're – very conservative, you might wait another year perhaps until it's uh, you know out there in the mainstream press. But if you're like me and you like to speculate on these situations that I think this is inevitable, I think this is a real game changer. Oh, yeah. There's a huge amount of e-waste. Yeah. E and, and it, it, it uh, takes care of the cyanide problem. I mean, there's certain states like Montana, you can't mine using cyanide, you know, and there's certain countries that don't allow it. So, I mean, this is really a big, big deal. It's just that no one seems to know about it outside of my readers, but that's okay for now. It's nice to be first on stuff, but oh, yeah. if you're, you know, as much of a boutique newsletter writer as I am, uh, until, you know, someone in the mainstream, and it will, because I know who's looking at this, and uh, we got NDAs, non-disclosure agreements, with some of the biggest companies out there that you know of. I just can't say anything about it because of the NDA that's been signed. But uh, sooner or later, this will come out 
And when it does, there'll probably be a pretty good rush initially into this technology. Oh, yeah. Well, we love it. New information for investments from Mr. Morgan. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. My pleasure. Thank you. Mr. David Morgan, precious metals expert and the founder of the Morgan Report. For the Industry Experts panel, I'm Michelle Holliday at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com.